scientific frauds. A fragment of meteorite was reportedly found in southwestern France in 1864, and the claim was made that it contained evidence of life from space, but it was not looked at closely for more than 100 years. Now, can you believe that scientists would not pursue proof of life from outer space if they had it in their hands? You know, it, it, it just kind of sounds strange if you think about it now. We've got this meteorite, and it's got life from outer space, and we put it on the shelf and forget about it for 100 years. It's like bringing moon rocks back, you know, and we'll put them on the shelf and we'll look at them 100 years from now. The fact is they needed some proof to support Darwin's recently published book. Now, remember, this is 1864. Darwin published his book in 1859. Five years later, they come up with proof. Now, the great scientist, Louis Pasteur, had just delivered a strong defense of divine creation as the only possible source of life, and the meteorite fragment proved Pasteur wrong. But, as it turns out, the meteorite was a fraud. A French microbiologist found that it had been altered by glue, seeds, coal, gravel, and tissue to impress the gullible. Now, while it was a fraud, I should point out that it was a French scientist who revealed that fraud. Now, have you ever heard of the meteorite from outer space discovered in 1864 being proven a fraud? I never had. So when I read in the scripture, you know, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, I take it at face value because I wasn't there and I can't contradict him. Now, there are other people out there who do. They do contradict him. They say, oh, no, he's a liar. But that's not true. That didn't happen that way. Let, let me explain the Big Bang to you. And then they go on and, they, they, and I ask them, you know, sometimes I say, well, were you there when the Big Bang occurred? And they all say, no. So you're not an eyewitness then? No, no, I'm, I'm not an eyewitness. But we have evidence. <clears throat> and then when we say, well, what evidence do you have? Well, <clears throat> uh, you know, and then they, they go on and they talk and babble and they use Greek words and big words that you and I can't pronounce and can't spell. And then that impresses us, and then we believe what they tell us because, after all, we don't like God anyway. I mean, there isn't any of us out here that like God. We hate him. We always have. We do now and always will. In fact, he even went so far as to say, you know, that... Uh, that uh, people, this is in, I think it's in Romans 8, verse 7, something like that. It says, the carnal mind is enmity against God. It isn't subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. And so when we adopt, when we embrace evolution, we're just doing what comes naturally. It's kind of like a Doberman pincher, you know. It just comes naturally, you know, to grab people and bite them. Archaeopteryx. God, that's a word, isn't it? Let me spell this for you in case you know you're a plumber like I am. It's spelled A-R-C-H-A-E-O-P-T-E-R-Y-X. And we couldn't call him, uh, we couldn't call him dinosaur bird. We have to call him Archaeopteryx. And then we say, spell it. A-R-C-H-A-E-O-P-T-E-R-Y-X. Evolutionists have told us that Archaeopteryx is a missing link between reptiles and birds, showing a gradual change from one to the other. Of course, they would need to produce thousands of fossils to show the change from one species to another. Well, they don't have thousands, but they got one. It's called Archaeopteryx. I can remember this guy. I can't spell him, but by God, I can remember him. He was in school when I was there in the 1950s. Archaeopteryx. I remember this guy. He was in the textbooks. I didn't know he was a fraud at that time. <clears throat> I believed he was a pretty good bird, or half bird, or half dinosaur. I, th I thought he was all right. Now, evolutionists put a great amount of faith in Ar Archaeopteryx, <clears throat> only to be disappointed again. Archaeopteryx, according to six British scientists, is a fake and fraud. That's right. Arch has turned out to be a dirty bird. Or to put it another way, Arch fouled his nest and theirs. The report said, quote, The controversy started when six scientists, including Sir Frederick Hoyle, a British astronomer, asserted in a scholarly paper in March that the feather impressions of the museum's specimen had been fabricated in the 19th century. It was a hoax, unquote. Note that this fraud took place only two years after Darwin published his book, so it tended to provide much-needed proof of Darwin's book in 1861. Hey, listen, <clears throat> that thing was still circulating in 1955 when I was in high school. 
when I was in high school, 1955. Now, the report continued, quote, one of the authors, Dr. Chandra, <laughs> watch this one, Wickrow Massengee, Wick, Wickrow Massengee, boys and girls, you cannot make up names like these. She's an <clears throat> astrophysicist and has been quoted in a British newspaper as saying the purported hoax was carried out by someone who made a paste of crushed limestone from the same period, smeared it round a genuine reptile fossil, and then imprinted the feathers. And it's interesting that Hoyle and Wickram Singhi wrote a book that documented this fraud in detail. And both are highly respected scientists. Now, we creationists are appreciative of their contribution to our cause. But then it was a contribution to science in general. Most evolutionists will not look at the truth if that truth interferes with some of their pet theories. <clears throat> All right, so now we've got uh, the space meteorite, and we've got the Archaeopteryx. Now, if you want to prove these out, what you do is you get online and you, you plug in Archaeopteryx and life from space. And then you'll see where these scientists that uncovered these frauds have written books See, in your college textbook, they're never going to tell you, hey, go look at this book written by Wick Ram Hemshi. You know, they're not going to do that. doesn't bolster their case. They shut up about it. Well, after all, that's what we do in law. You know, if we're, if we're in court and there's some piece of evidence that will bolster your case, you can rest assured that I'm not going to present it. <clears throat> now, is that honest? No. No, it's not honest. But then who in hell ever said that a lawyer was honest? I mean, come on, let's wake up and smell the coffee here, kids. If you've got a cause over here that you're trying to promote, you know, it's like trying to sell Chevrolet automobiles. What are you going to do? Point out to people that the rear end in our Chevrolet automobile is pretty weak and that the Ford really has a better rear end and, you know, a better engine or, you know. But no, no, we, 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 we don't tell you about our weak links or, or spots or points in our automobiles and our products. We point out the weak points in the Lexus. We say, hey, that Lexus over there, it's, it's pretty weak up here. See? <clears throat> and ours is really strong there. Java Man. Let's take a look at Java Man here. One good example of actual data being rejected for ideology is the Java Man, discovered by Eugene Du Bois in 1890. They dug out a small part of an upper skull, a tooth, a socket, three teeth, and the left thigh bone. And those few bones were not found together. They were 70 feet apart. Of course, there was no way to know that each one of these fossil parts made up the same person. They were also found over a year's period of time. But that fact wasn't revealed until much later either. Now, you wouldn't know it from the textbooks, but the experts disagreed over Java Man. The German zoologists believe he was an ape. The English zoologists believed that he was a human, and the French thought that he was an ape man. Now, from the meager remains, the scientists made some amazing deductions. One evolutionist said that Java man had a tail. Another said that his jaw projected like a snout. Now, that's called creative reconstruction, or more precisely, it is quackery. But quackery abounds in evolutionary circles. Now comes Heckel, who had a life-size model of Java Man constructed that was exhibited in museums all across Europe. A detailed drawing was made showing the hair on his head, and any intelligent person seeing Java Man in the papers had no thought that they were looking at a portrait of a thigh bone, three teeth, and a fragment of the cranium. Unquote. But the big secret that Du Bois kept from everyone is that he had found two human heads at that same level in the same strata of which he found Java Man. Of course, that would have eliminated Java as ape man since men were already living. After all, you can't live before your parents do, except in the fairy tale called evolution. 
Eugene Du Bois, the discoverer of Java Man, finally admitted just before his death that Java Man was not an ape man at all. The skull was really the remains of a large gibbon tailless ape. After he blew the whistle on this fraud, some evolutionists continued to promote Java Man in the school textbooks as a person who had actually lived. Other evolutionists dismissed Du Bois as unreliable because of his admission of fraud. Real people of character, right? Now, why don't the scientists ask some really pertinent questions in regard to uncovered bones? And of course, some scientists did reject Java as an ape man, but these objections were lost in the crowd that applauded the discovery because it supported Darwin when he needed the support. Now, how could a handful of bones be used to reconstruct a prehistoric race, even with the hair color? How could they be so sure that the bones belong to the same individual? How have those unpetrified bones survived for the alleged million years. But evolutionary scientists don't ask those kinds of hard questions that would reveal the fact that evolution is resting upon nothing except hot air, imagination, wishful thinking, circular reasoning, and outright fraud. It's just plain lies. Many of the evolutionists must write part-time for the Saturday morning cartoon shows. After all, making deductions about Java man's snout and tail from the meager evidence discovered is like finding the rear wheel of a 1959 Edsel in a ditch, along with the left front headlight and arriving at the conclusion that the original Edsel had been driven 76,000 miles at an average speed of 41 miles an hour by a little old lady from Pasadena with fallen arches. And they call this science, boys and girls. Hey, we'll be back with more next time on scientific frauds. Hey, our time's up. I've got to leave it right there. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Same time, same station. God willing, of course. So until then, thanks for listening, everybody, and good night, friends.